and other withered stumps of time were told upon the walls. Staring forms leaned out, leaning hushing the room enclosed. Footsteps shuffled on the stair, under the firelight, under the brush. Her hair spread out in fiery points, glowed into words, then would be savagely still. All of this and more on this week's episode of Ask Hat Air. But first, the news. You are tuned to WNDR, the voice of Wonderland. I'm M. Turtle. Here are the headlines. Authorities have issued an amber alert for either an infant who looks like a pig or a pig who looks like an infant. Should you have information concerning this missing child and or swine, please alert either the Department of Infant Care or Biddleberg's Butcher Shop. A reward is being offered of either 500 gold pieces or the informant's weight in sausage. Royal alchemists have finally discovered how the little crocodile improves its shining tail, according to a new study from the Institute for Chicanery. The Queen has ordered all crocodiles under the age of 70 rotations to the palace for slaughter. In unrelated news, economists are expecting a surplus of the Queen's patented youth serum in the next fiscal quarter, so feel free to lube up in excess through the year's end. And finally, tomorrow marks the beginning of the 314th annual Wonderland charity Snark Hunt. This year's three-day event is intended to raise money for snark awareness and education should an actual snark ever be found. The event is expected to draw thousands and satisfy none. And to the weather this week, expect mad winds blowing north-northwest early in the week, shifting to southerly winds with an 80% chance of hawks or handsaws. Frankly, we cannot differentiate between the two. Ahead this hour, Hatter and Hare field your questions on the topics of friendship and murderous ballads. The time is currently slipping away from you. Hold your loved ones close to your graying breast. Hello, and welcome to Ask Hatter and Hare. I'm Hatter. And I'm Hare, and we're here to help you help us help you. Let's get started, eh? This next note is from Sue H., who writes, Hatter and Hare, I have a friend who, as I've gotten to know her, has just ended up being an extremely disappointing person, and I've grown apathetic toward her. Yet, when she starts to feel my pulling away, her insecurity starts screaming in her face, and she then barrages me with her need for reassurance, and so I return to spending time with her. I don't trust her. I don't tell her anything about my personal life anymore, and I mostly give her advice so that she'll shut up. I want to break up with her, but how do you break up? with a friend. That's a tough one. Truly. An emotional severance of this magnitude requires something of a light touch, lest it end in some unseemly crying jag. (sighs) Other people's emotions are exhausting. I've actually got a good prescription for such an occasion. Oh, thank heavens. First off, think of all the things that your friend is interested in. What is a passion? Is it horses? Art? Toxicology? Figure it out, and you got your first step toward a theme party. Wait, hold on. A theme party, you say? Bear with me. Bearing? Take great pains to plan and execute the perfect theme party. Make sure that it has all of the things expected. Balloons and cake and clowns and pony rides. No matter what her passion is, clowns and pony rides are universal. Well, that's just a given. That doesn't mean you should stop at clowns and pony rides. Go further. Be lavish. Oysters on half shell, caviar, champagne, fire walking, spare no expense. This will be the event of the season. Now, make sure you choose a location worthy of such an event. Your backyard or office won't do. Neither will the nearest public house, though you should consider retiring to the public house once the event draws to a close. Now, for this, you want glamour. And space, because you're going to need to invite literally every person you know in common. Friends, check. Co-workers, exes, check, check. Do a little digging. Invite their family, aunts, uncles, cousins, even if you don't know them personally. Now, on a night of the event, dress to the nines in your fineries. Have a calming cocktail. When you enter, you are not just a party-goer. You 
or a host. Be friendly to all you see. Press palms, strike up the band, dance, feast. Make sure everyone is having a time of their lives. And then, at the peak of festivities, take the limelight. Silence the band. Call your friend to the stage. By this point, your friend should be glowing. Surrounded by so much unbridled joy, worn out from dancing and laughing and pony riding, she will truly feel supported, safe, loved, really, truly loved. This is the time to rip into her. List her faults in minute detail. Those places people don't normally dare to go, go there. Tell her that the mere thought of looking upon her smug, stupid face one more time would be too much to bear. You'd rather stab your own eyes out. You'd rather turn your eardrums to useless flaps of floppy flesh than have to listen to one more insipid word dripping from her mealy mouth. Make sure that however you start, you end by screaming incoherently because your disdain cannot be bound by mere words. Spittle is optional, but why scrimp now that you come so far? Promptly exit and never ever look back. You won't be hearing from her again. That was breathtaking. Works every time. Well, Sue, I hope that gives you a good framework for moving forward. Do drop us a line to let us know how it goes for you. Yes? <laughs> Oh, come on! This is an alert from the Royal Emergency Proclamation Service. Please stand by for information and instructions from Her Royal Highness. This is an alert from the Royal Emergency Proclamation Service. Today's decree comes from a long-lost journal entry of a common mouse. I don't quite know what I'm doing here. I truly don't. I suppose it's because someone suggested I was worth it, but I'm not so sure. In fact, I tend to believe folks put up with me out of some latent sense of kindness. It's a miserable thing to think about, being put up with or just put on, allowed to participate in life out of some sense of communal obligatory pity. But I went out and did it anyway, didn't I? I most certainly did. I went out there and stole. Maybe I murdered, too. I'm sure I did. At least I think so. I remember I crawled out that morning. I had to get food, you see. They were expecting it. It's what was expected of me. It's what they asked of me. And so I went out to get it. I could smell it across the hard plains over in the big white tomb past Wood Plateau. It was new and fresh. I could tell. But when I set out to get it, I could hear that monster breathing. Did you know it rattles when it sleeps or when it's comfortable? It's a loud, rhythmic death hum that rolls up into your hackles and down your tails until it shakes in terror. I heard it somewhere in the distance, out in the heather field at the far edge of the hard plains. My ears trembled, I tell you. But I set out anyway. I went out into the plain, scuttling fast on my feet. I'm a pretty fast runner. I could move quickly and dart under and around things. It's my talent, I guess, if I'm allowed any at all. Anyway, I guess I was about halfway across, just about to Wood Plateau, which I like to follow around its edge closely because its shade makes me harder to see when the giants are about. I guess I was halfway there when I remember the rattling suddenly stopped. It stopped cold, and so did the blood running through me because though the rattling is horrible, it's much worse when it stops. That means it's up and moving and that maybe it sees or smells you. It has great smell, you know, remarkable senses, better than my own. And sure enough, before I reached Wood Plateau, a shadow loomed above me, but before I could move or run or flee away, I was tossed into the air, past the great whiskered face of the beast with its sharp teeth out wide and gleeful with power and death. I landed hard, and before I could shake it off, its paw was on me, pressing me into a cold, hard square of the plains. 
it reached down. And as I think this terror runs up and down my spine, I tell you, it reached down and snagged me by my tail and flung me skyward again, only this time it aimed to kill me with its teeth. Its maw was wide open and below, and I knew I just knew I was finished. Unless, I reasoned, if I just turned my body into a torpedo and aim straight down, aim for its mouth speed toward it, that I might just make it. And so I turned and flattened my legs against my fur and straightened my tail into a quill and shot straight into its mouth past its teeth and down into the dark chasm of its throat where I suppose I landed in its stomach because I was covered in putrid bile filth that burned at my eyes and curled my fur until it began to fall off entirely. But I didn't care. I was going to succeed. I was inside it now, alive. Yes, very much alive. And I began to dig, scratch, and claw my way through its lining, its greasy, petulant pestilence, its horrid sinews and cavities, its fats and sinews. I ripped apart vessels and arteries that soaked my fur and let the awful detritus stick to me. I dug my claws raw and then dull, but dug all the more. I dug against its bucking, its final understanding that it was dying, that I was murdering it. I dug until I pulled at tough fibrous tissues and saw deep blood spattering across the hard plains and let its yowl fill my ears and make me bare my buck teeth and final victory. Oh yes, oh yes, let them pity me. I will bring them their cheese, but let them pity me nonetheless. Oh, yes, let them. Don't tell them I am one of them, that I am one of you. Oh, yes. That is all, loyal subjects. This has been a broadcast of the Royal Emergency Proclamation Service. If you have received this message in error or have had difficulty with the transmission of this material, report at your own risk. Thank you for your mandatory participation. Now back to our regularly scheduled program. Well, that was uh, enlightening, I suppose. Yes, enlightening. At any rate... Moving on. Yes, our next letter comes from Nori T and... Los Angeles, California. Ah, the city of angels. Yes, angels. Nori writes, Dear Hatter and Hare, I have a superstition that has taken over my life. If the dawn brings pink clouds, I fear that I will lose a friend. It's not that every time I see pink clouds, someone I love dies, but every time someone I love has died, I've seen pink clouds at dawn. I am scared to open the blinds before the dawn has passed. I'm being silly, right? But then, how do I shake this superstition? I mean, you've answered your question right there, haven't you? Don't look at the clouds. Bam! You've defied death. I don't believe that it is that simple. No? You see, I have personal experience with something similar, and my response was quite different. Oh, well, go on then. Thank you. You're welcome. When I was a wee proto-hatter, in my younger and more vulnerable years, I happened upon a simple tune, a minuet in a minor key, haunting little thing. When I heard it, I would become suddenly filled to the brim with a theretofore unimaginable dread. And why is that? You see, whenever I heard it, a life-threatening event would follow soon thereafter. What do you mean, life-threatening? Well, the first time I heard the tune, I was walking down a filthy side street on a minor errand for my mother. I couldn't have been older than eight or nine, just walking down High Street to my destination when I heard it. The minuet was drifting out from a nearby alleyway, whistled by some drunken sod or another. It ensnared me for reasons I still cannot explain. I paused to locate the source of the tune, but my investigation was cut suddenly and violently short by the most horrid of screams from above. I looked up to discover a large iron pot falling fast toward me from a second-story window. I had barely enough time to sidestep the catastrophe before the pot landed with a magnificent clang. 
cracking the pavement stone by my feet. Had it been my skull instead of the street, I'd not be here with you today. Corblimey. Corblimey, indeed. On a second occasion, mere weeks later, I paused to listen to a one-man band play the offending minuet and was almost trampled by a team of horses who had broken loose from their carriage driver. <sighs> Ooh. After a half-dozen further events of a similar nature, I grew a steady and, some would say justified, paranoia concerning the song. After a dozen more years of the same, over and over, the paranoia became all-consuming. Crippling! By the time I was in the Haberdasher Academy, I found myself avoiding music halls, coffee and tea houses, anywhere where one may be reasonably expected to hear popular music. I was afraid to step out of my front door and into the squalid streets for fear of a too sudden departure from this corporeal plane. And so, one day, I stockpiled a massive store of supplies and then locked myself indoors. That's entirely understandable. What happened? Well, nothing at first. Days became weeks, weeks became months. And then... And then? And then... I... ran out of... sanitary necessities. What, like, for the loo? For the loo, yes. And even at its most feverish, my superstition could not supersede the desire for a clean bottom, and so I decided to murder that superstition. And you did that exactly how? Quite simple. I grabbed that superstition by its trembling throat and dragged it out of the house and down the street and into the very first music hall that I could find. And I marched right up to the band and I requested that deadly minuet. And I stood there and they played it. And what happened? I was almost immediately stabbed in the gut by a drunkard. Cool, blimey. Seems as though I bore a striking resemblance to the man who'd cuckolded at him just the previous week. That's bad luck. Perhaps. What conclusion did you reach in the matter? Well, none at the time. I was too busy being exsanguinated on a filthy dance floor. But once the bleeding was staunched and I had my full facilities back in time to ruminate, I reached this simple conclusion. Oh well. Oh well? Oh well. Something's going to get me. We're all going to get got, as they say. Either there is no correlation between the minuet and my imminent death, or there is, in which case I've got an alarm bell. Either way, I am more aware each time I hear it of death itself. Like a uh, musical memento mori. Exactly. At any rate, Nori, I suggest that you embrace your superstitions, appreciate their roots, but do not become slaves to them, or... You may very well run out of toilet paper. You're no good to anyone with a soiled dirt button. Not at all. Well, I do believe that that is all the time we have for today. Thanks for joining us. We do hope it was helpful. Remember to keep sending in your questions to askcatherineair at gmail.com. We really do look forward to hearing from you. After all, we live to serve. Been listening to Ask Hatter and Hair here on WNDR. Today's episode was written by Nicholas Tukoski with contributions from Bernard Clark and Mike Johns. The Queen's pronouncement today was written by Jared Alexander. Our podcast is edited by Grayson Bergman with additional material recorded by Mike Johns. Music is by Paul Mercer. Thanks also to the continuing glorious guidance of Parker Davidson. Your voice talent today belong to Gina Rakiki, Mike Johns, Bernard Zotaro Clark, and Nicholas Tukoski. Have a question for Hatter and Hair? You can get in touch at askhatterandhair.com. The Inverted Hour is ahead next. You are listening to WNDR. I'm M. Turtle. Thank you for joining us. The time is 11 flower pots. Flowerpots.